Hola, buenas tardes. Bueno, vamos a dar comienzo a la última sesión de este ciclo del programa Arquitecturas eh, Lenguajes Fílmicos, eh, Proyectar lo Real, que tiene un poco su origen ya hace años, unos, hace unos seis o siete años, eh, la productora BNV, BNV Producciones de Sevilla, antes de que yo llegara a tratar de poner en marcha esta entelequia de la capital cultural europea de la cultura, eh, me llamaron para colaborar con ellos a la hora de pensar un, un proyecto que permitiera pensar un poco la ciudad, la organización de la ciudad a partir de sus representaciones. Fundamentalmente era el cine, no tanto el cine, sino digamos un poco ese universo cada vez más eh, multiforme de, de manifestaciones audiovisuales o multimedia, ¿no? que de alguna manera han contribuido a constituir un corpus de reflexión visual sobre, sobre la ciudad, pero también un poco sobre las relaciones de la ciudad con la naturaleza y con el territorio, incluso con la gobernanza de, de ese territorio. Ese ciclo tuvo un recorrido en, en Andalucía y un poco antes de llegar aquí, ya digo, de regresar a San Sebastián de una forma puntual, eh, me llamaron de la Fundación Cristina Enea y también del Colegio de Arquitectos, Ivón y Oyer, bueno, Chema, bueno, todos los que estabais trabajando un poco en Cristina Enea, para que pudiéramos hacer este ciclo aquí en, en San Sebastián y y crear, digamos, un, un espacio de, esa era la idea, por lo menos, una especie de espacio de tensión dialéctica entre las instituciones, las organizaciones, las asociaciones, los colectivos y las personas que, de alguna manera, están construyendo eh, la ciudad eh, y, y contribuirlo, digamos, un poco desde la potencia simbólica de, del arte y de la representación. Hicimos el año pasado… Eh, el primer ciclo, el primero, sí, y este es el segundo. La oficina de la capitalidad, a la que me incorporé el año pasado, eh, pensó que este, este espacio de discusión se podría abrir perfectamente a otros ámbitos y que podría permitir en este proceso hacia ese año… Eh, bueno, establecer, digamos, un foro entre profesionales, entre, bueno, entre ciudadanos, ciudadanas, que pensara esta ciudad también. Bueno, este es el segundo, el segundo año. Eh, esta entelequia de la capital cultural europea, no tiene presente, no sé si tiene futuro, digo no tiene presente porque dentro de unos meses sabremos si esta entelequia adquiere forma, se consolida y forma sólida o simplemente es un globo que hace pluf y estalla y en pedacitos y no, no queda nada. Pero estoy seguro que de alguna manera eh, en ese, sedi ese pequeño sedimento que se ha constituido a lo largo de, estos, de este poco tiempo y a través de las mediaciones personales y en fin, institucionales que hemos tenido, podría coger cuerpo. Si nosotros seguimos, o si la oficina de la capital cultural sigue, contribuiremos a que tenga medios y recursos y pueda conectarse con otras redes internacionales y otros espacios de reflexión en torno a estas cuestiones que hay en Europa y un poco por el mundo también. Y si no, me imagino que que la Fundación Cristina Eneal y el colegio se atreverán a ir solitos, bien acompañados entre ellos, y encontrarán también otras alianzas, porque creo que será estupendo tener tiempo para pensar sobre las ciudades, sobre esta ciudad. Quiero eh, dar las gracias expresamente a Juan y Payasma, porque eh, es de estos hombres... que yo, Manuel, que está aquí, que de BNV Producciones, que ha... Que ha trabajado en, en todos estos años en estos proyectos, 
de esos hombres que uno persigue siempre porque piensa que tiene muchas cosas que decir y que además siempre él responde generosamente diciendo que estaría muy dispuesto, pero nunca encuentras una fecha para que pueda llegar porque está tan ocupado, tiene en fin, un calendario tan, tan ajustado, pero siempre desde el primer momento que recuerdo que le llamamos hace ya unos años, nos dijo sí, sí, me encantaría, me encantaría y al final hemos conseguido después de bastante tiempo que esté aquí. Creo, cre, creo que es un cierre... Eh, extraordinario a un programa notable que hemos conseguido cerrar los dos últimos años y espero que los siguientes y darle especialmente las gracias por ese largo viaje en el tiempo al que le hemos perseguido durante mucho tiempo para que viniera y también en el espacio porque ha venido desde arriba al norte, norte de Europa y dar las gracias. Daros las gracias también eh, a la Fundación Cristina Enea y al Colegio de Arquitectos y a todos vosotros, que muchos habéis sido eh, caras eh, habituales en este ciclo y espero que esto pueda seguir adelante y que, y que nada, pues nada, muchas gracias y cuando quieras, eh, Ivonne. Bueno, yo os quiero dar las Espero de te... Va a tener espero de ciclones de Jarraitzea. Necesitas a Santi que esté que no se argui. Eta... <coughs> En la intensidad de la pizca, Yuhan Iren, en donde ignora la pizca, te explica que te quiero enviar con Bioar. Yuhan invita a pensar tu gendú en Nean, va a hacer esa, bueno, ciclo en Ningurwan, va a pensar tu debe, va a reunir un goiría que está arquitectura, y lo dirá en Ningurwan, era aquí tendirela. O regatic veré testutan, esta pizca veré testua que. Es algo que se instituye, pues que te convida a tener un libro aquí a curtir, a ver el libro aquí, a ti que, pues que te, yo ni para ellos me había urtuda, has que no urte tan arquitectura en deriva o en crítico en agusi en esta cosa. Auda, al dar rica tendo arquitectura que te iría quizá más de tela, visite con espacio aquí, está esa investe venir a te con espacio aquí. Verás, eh, ni que usted, eh, Gaurko bere al día, eh, ciclo a Huisteco, eh, eh, usted eh, ichiera ego quien adala, eta regate, bueno, eskertzen deu eh, bere presencia, eta, bueno, arquitecto en el cargo de Tibaita, eskertu, eh, bai, eh, Donostia Bimilla, Tomás y eh, Bulego Ari, eta Cristina Nea Fundación Ari, ba, bueno, eh, aurten baita ere eginda colana, eta biarko bioar, eh, Villar eh, Tallerra M. Bertan y Sangoda es Cristina Enean, Gogora Checo. Eta eh, Villarco programa Tuta Segón eh, Changoa, el resto de Deitz de, de, de Guna. Esta Villar y Sangoa dice que está Chera Tucoda, Ochaya que eh, Bostera. Pisca te interesa tu Adaudenac, eh, Cristina Enean de Itu de Saquezueta, bueno, pisca te finca tú. Vestir Gaveta, Baitas Carricasco, pisca ciclo Jarra y tu de su angustio y eta. Y se mango de Ogullo, Janiri. Good afternoon. Let me begin in a, with a personal note. I would not probably be here without certain films that I saw early in my childhood. I grew up in Finland uh, during the war years uh, from 39 to 45 at my grandfather's remote small farm. And there were no communications with the outside world except a newspaper that came once a week. But as it happened, I saw a film in the local uh, cinema uh, at uh, the age of 10 years. It was a Russian film based on a folk tale and I can still remember it. I, I think I can recall every single image of that 
the film. It made such a tremendous impression on me. In those years, there were uh, traveling men who traveled around the poor countryside with a rather primitive uh, film projection machinery, and they showed usually newsreels. And those newsreels made me understand that there is a wider world around. In my student years, certain films, and I can mention two of them, or three of them, The Golden Age and Andalusian Dog by Louis Buñuel, and uh, a film, uh, The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman, made uh, again a huge impression on me, and I realized that there is a reality beyond the everyday reality that we experience. There is a poetic reality. I began to read poetry, and that is probably the road which has led me to San Sebastian. Without the early films, I would still be somewhere in the countryside. Films can have uh, decisive impacts on our lives. So can paintings, novels, sculpture, and I would say architecture. We are going to uh, see one of the most beautiful and poetic films I have ever seen. Uh, the film Nostalgia by Andrei Tarkovsky tonight. I will, before we uh, view the film, I will just say some, a few ideas about the relationship between architecture and cinema, because I'm an architect by profession, but uh, I'm rather intensely studying film even. Now, um, and then I will say, I will give two examples of uh, how architecture and cinema interact. And I will first talk about the architecture of fear or terror in the case of Hitchcock. And then I will speak about the architecture of erosion in the case of uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. Um, I have a rather uh, long script which I will have to uh, seriously cut in order to uh, not to uh, spend too much time, but I will suggest uh, that I leave a copy of my full lecture manuscript here and anyone who would like to have a copy could get it uh, later. Geometric and lived space. This is a fundamental difference. Uh, we architects tend to think of uh, space as a geometric, uh, through a geometric definition, whereas we all understand and experience space as a lived phenomenon. The mental task of real buildings and cities is to structure our being in the world. Being in the world is a Heideggerian notion. And to articulate the encounter between the experiencing self and the world. That's the way I understand the task of architecture. It's about our relationship with the world rather than giving us a shelter against the rain or a place to work in or live in. 
the more important task of architecture is a mental one. But doesn't the film director do exactly the same with his projected imageries? Cinema projects cities, buildings, and rooms where human situations and interactions take place. More importantly, cinema constructs spaces in the mind of the viewer and projects an architecture of mental imagery and memory that reflects the inherent archetypal architecture of the human mind, thought, and emotion. The film architecture uh, deals with the architecture that we all have in our minds and memories. Architectural constructions are built in the world of matter and Euclidean geometry, but lived space always transcends the rules of physics and geometry. Architecture structures and domesticates meaningless physical space for human habitation by project projecting existential meanings onto it. That's the essence of architecture. Architecture projects existential meanings to meaningless physical space. Lived space resembles the ephemeral structures of dream and the unconscious, organized independently of the boundaries of physical space and time. Lived space is always a dialectical combination of external space and the inner mental space, past and present, actuality and mental projection. In the case, I'm sure, in your minds, you are here in this very space, but at the same time, occasionally you are somewhere, uh, you, you uh, fall into memorizing something or uh, wishing for something. So that's the mental lived space. It's not here and now in physical reality. It's a dream space. When experiencing lived space, memory and dream, fear and desire, value and meaning fuse with the actual percepts. Lived space is space that is inseparably integrated with the subject's concurrent life situation. But isn't that also the kind of space that architects should be engaged in rather than geometric space? I would say yes. Also architecture has to accommodate with this dream space that we, we have in our our minds. We do not live separately in material and mental worlds. These experiential dimensions are inseparably intertwined. Neither do we live in an objective world. That's the, the huge mistake that uh, Western education, for instance, makes, trying to make us believe that we live in an objective world. We live in mental worlds in which the experienced, remembered, and imagined, as well as the past, present, and future are intertwined. This is what Italo Calvino, the great Italian writer, says. Who are we? Who is each one of us? If not a combinatoria of experiences, information, books we have read, things imagined. Each life is an encyclopedia, a library 
an inventory of objects, a series of styles, and everything can be constantly shuffled and reordered in every way conceivable. This, I think, is a rather impressive account of what, what is the kind of uh, awareness that we have of uh, every, in, in everyday life. The modes of experiencing architecture and cinema become practically identical in this mental space that meanders without fixed boundaries. Even in the art of architecture, a mental image is transferred from the experiential realm of the architect to the mental world of the observer and the material building is a mere mediating object, an image object. We tend to think of architect architecture uh, as objects. I would rather say they are mediating objects that mediate something from my mind as an architect to your mind as individuals that uh, encounter that building. And I think that's a much more lively uh, understanding of architecture than, than seeing it as, as a dead objects, ob object, perhaps aestheticized, but, but dead. No, buildings are alive since they are products of um, human uh, mind and imagination. In his seminal essay entitled The Work of Art, in the age of mechanical reproduction, Walter Benjamin deliberates on the connection between architecture and film. And somewhat surprisingly, he suggests that regardless of their apparent visuality, the two art forms are in fact tactile arts. Both architecture and film are tactile arts. In Benjamin's view, architecture and film are communicated primarily through the tactile realm in opposition to the pure visuality of painting. This idea suggests that although the normal situation of viewing a film turns the viewer into a bodiless observer. The illusory cinematic space gives the viewer back his or her body as the experiential haptic and motor space evokes powerful kinesthetic experiences. A film is viewed with the muscles and skin as much as by the eyes, I would say more by the muscles and skin than the eyes. The first takes place, uh, sorry, both architecture and cinema imply a kinesthetic way of experiencing space. The first, meaning architecture, takes place through actual embodied movement the second through ideated action, imagined ac action. In opposition to the visual understanding of memory, uh, Edward S. Casey, a philosopher, one of the important phenomenological thinkers of our time, makes this explicit in his argument when he says, to sharpen the issue of the essence of the act of remembering, let me state boldly that there is no memory without body memory. In claiming this, I do not mean to say that whenever we remember, we are in fact directly engaged in body uh, memory. Rather, I'm saying that we could not remember without having the capacity for body memory. I'm saying this, quoting this just to emphasize the importance of the body 
in not only architectural uh, or cinematic uh, experience, but in our uh, mental activities. <coughs> I suggest that the images stored in our memory are embodied and haptic images rather than retinal pictures. We remember the world as lived spaces and situations, not as mere pictures. Try to make uh, a personal experiment. Try to think of a photograph that is dear to you or a photo famous photograph that you remember. I argue or I suggest that you cannot remember that photograph as a two-dimensional image. You remember it as a spatial situation, although you have never seen that spatial image uh, situation. Simply that reality of experience is so fundamental to human per perception and, and mind so that we bring life to, to the lifeless. Analyzing the difference between painting and film, Benjamin gives a provocative metaphor. He compares the painter to the magician and the cameraman to the surgeon. The magician operates at a distinct distance from the patient, whereas the surgeon penetrates into the patient's very uh, interior. The magician painter penetrates, uh, sorry, the magician painter creates a complete integrated entity, whereas the surgeon painter, uh, sorry, the surgeon cameraman's work is engaged in fragments. Benjamin's metaphor can be reversed to illustrate the difference between the film director and the architect. The film director is the magician who evokes a lived situation from a distance through the illusory reality of projected images, whereas the architect operates within the physical reality itself in the very intestines of the building that we happen to inhabit. I will then jump a long way through my manuscript to um, the part that I uh, said I would speak of, and that is uh, the examples of Hitchcock and uh, Tarkovsky. Stages for fear. The task of architecture as a resonator or amplifier of mental impact is clearly reflected in the cinematic architectures of two directors with opposite emotional aspirations. As the architecture of Alfred Hitchcock creates spaces of thrill and terror. Andrei Tarkovsky's rooms convey feelings of longing and nostalgia. These two directors survey the architectural metaphysics of fear and melancholy, respectively, and reveal the powerful interaction of the setting and the narrative. The situationality of architectural meaning is particularly clear in Hitchcock's art. In his films, such as North by Northwest, Rare Window, Vertigo, Psycho, and The Birds, for instance, buildings have a central role. Hitchcock is indeed 
very conscious of the mental workings and meanings of architecture. His interest in architecture is expressed in his response to Francois Truffaut's question concerning the house in his early film, Sabotage. This is what uh, Hitchcock answers. In a way, the whole film is a story of that house. The house was one of the three key figures in the film. End of quote. Hitchcock also confesses that the two buildings